Hey guys, so Cal Val here. You are listening to the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast. I'm your host, Adam Cousins, and I'm joined initially by, by my co-host, uh, Fiona Lockren. Fiona, um, before we introduce our guest, I'll make a quick reference to yesterday. Uh, you, We was watching uh, in America, you call it soccer, over here we call it football, uh, and it was England versus Scotland in a in a so-called friendly, uh, which you never have a friendly with England and Scotland. But funny enough, me and our guest this evening both text you at around about the same time, both saying he, 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 as England battered Scotland. But apart from that, Fiona, in the last hour of the day that I have not seen you, how are you now? I was fine up until about 30 seconds ago, <laughs> until you reminded me of the football score. Um, no, I'm good, thank you. I'm marvellous. What a shame. You, well, you've done well, apart from your friendly, so don't worry. It's not, it's not a bad result, is it, really? <laughs> anyway, uh, enough about us. Let's talk to our guest. And what a guest we have. British Wrestling Royalty. I love the British Wrestling we've had. We've had Mar like Martin Stone on before as well. Me and you, Fiona, sat there and had a great chat with him. But today we have someone who doesn't do a lot of this, so it makes it even more special for us. It is Doug Williams. Doug, good evening to you. <clears throat> Good evening, Adam, and uh, good evening, Fee. Nice Hello. to see you again. Yes, um, you're right. I don't do many of them, so I'd like to say count yourselves lucky. But <laughs> <laughs> we feel very honoured. You know, eh? We are. We're, to have you. Yeah, we are very privileged to have you on, Doug. We appreciate your time definitely this evening. Um, let's kick off with something that's happening very soon. Actually, you are. We say you don't do many of these. Um, but we you are presenting an evening with Doug Williams up in Manchester on the, on the 12th of November. So realistically, question is, Doug, you don't do many of these. You don't do many of those. What's changed now that you want to kind of do more of those? <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously, um, I stopped wrestling in June um, and I wanted to, uh, I, you know, I had some surgery. I had knee replacement surgery. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to take a couple of months off of of, of anything wrestling related mm -hmm. whatsoever. I just wanted to, you know, concentrate on normal life, recovery, getting myself back into reasonable shape, um, you know, mentally and physically. Um, and to be honest with you, because of the surgery, physically traveling or, or, or going anywhere or, or doing anything was difficult. So it, it's now the opportunity um, presents itself now that I'm fit and, and quite and quite you know mobile um, to start doing um, the occasional thing now and then not and I don't want to do too much that's physical. I yeah. mean, I'll have, you know happily do seminars and and like I say that this this I'll see how this evening goes you know the evening with uh with me in Manchester see how that goes and we can and we can progress things from there. But I mean, I just take, I, I just want to do stuff that I'm going to enjoy doing now, you know, as opposed to taking everything and anything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How have you found that transition from not wrestling to wrestling? Because quite as you say, you stopped wrestling in June, you had your surgery, but how has that transition been for you? <clears throat> yeah, no, it's been fine, to be honest with you, because I wasn't enjoying wrestling, to be honest with you. I was getting hurt every single time. I, I, I hurt something every time I were, wrestled. And um, that was kind of getting me down a little bit. And I know now kind of the styles change and and, and and what's what's kind of prevalent now on the on, on the scene is 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 you know is is just something that I'd rather the young guys did and got themselves over and pushed themselves forward. Um I mean, you know, the reason I came back originally from from when I first started in 2018 was you know, help the British scene coming out of lockdown and also to you know, help educate some of the younger guys. And I felt that I've done that over the last couple of years. I think I've done enough. British scene is pretty good again. So, um, yeah, it just felt right. And I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't missed it. Um, first time I did anything wrestling related is when I went to Wembley for AEW two weeks ago. And I enjoyed the show. I enjoyed the atmosphere. But I certainly didn't want to felt I didn't feel like I wanted to get in there and and and, and do it. <laughs> what was you doing for AEW, uh, Doug? I, I missed that. Unfortunately, that was took off where I was at, in hospital, so I, I didn't yeah. get a chance to go and see that. So, what was a uh, what was you doing there for AEW? 
I was just there on on the guest list as a spectator watching. Yeah. Oh, okay. In the show, that's all. Go on, Fee, was was you... it nice to just sit back and relax and just watch it and not have to worry about anything other than enjoying yourself? Well, yeah, that 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 was you know a, a big big part of it, you know, and um, just I just enjoyed the atmosphere, you know, as a fan as opposed to you know on the inside of the ring looking out. I'm I'm I'm, I'm part of the audience, and that was a great experience in respect to that, you know. Um, and it's always it's always interesting to to see you know even even when I'm like that I've still got a little bit of a wrestler's brain on me so I watch the audience see what they react to and how thing how things work and how things don't but it didn't take away from my overall enjoyment I mean it's such a spectacle wasn't it it's so amazing yeah, it was show something that, else it really was yeah, it was, it was Sorry, Adam. no I was gutted to miss it my, my girlfriend went uh, she was back in to, to say this my store stuff happened when we was on holiday seeing my family in Cornwall uh-huh. so she come back and I, I literally could have got there but the train strikes prevented me coming home or earlier to get to get to it so uh, I'll be there next year but we're that way Put it that way. Um, let's talk about the you mentioned British wrestling there. I've so we we do a bit on hitting the turnbuckle. We've sponsored British wrestling, we sponsored some wrestlers, we've put on, we've co-produced a show with Ignite Buckle Up for you. were there. Uh, we've got our hitting the turnbuckle championship, which the new champion's gonna well, the first champion's gonna be crowned on Sunday at Ignite. Uh, you mentioned you were helping the, the wrestling scene from sort of pre to post-COVID. How do you find the scene? I know you've been away from wrestling, but how have you found the scene that you've gone you, that you've seen currently in 2023? <clears throat> oh, it's, it's almost back to the same level it was in say 2000, 2019, 2000, you know, early 2020. Um, there's a myriad of different independent promoters across the country that are all drawing, you know, reasonable crowds and putting on quality shows. It's 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 at a level that. It, Almost out of that. Well, no, I say it's probably on a par to where it was in say 2018, where it was this last, last peak, really, um, which is a great thing, you know, the recovery and and, and um, just the just the fact that there's so many great young wrestlers still coming through this, you know, whatever system exists, whatever culture exists in the United Kingdom, we seem to breed really, really good wrestlers, you know. Um, Whatever, whatever style you, you you prefer, the you know, everyone seems now to have a very good grasp of the modern style, and and and, and in my, our part of it, I think, is that there's so many shows and the volume of how many how often people can wrestle in this country helps a lot. But it's just the whole culture in the United Kingdom. Uh, we produce some of the the best wrestlers in the world, and that's carried on yeah. right through to now. You certainly do. I mean, I, I've I've gone yeah. to see quite, I've gone to see a few Rev Pro shows. Obviously, I do a bit work with Ignite. I go yeah. to a local one in Essex, and some of the guys you even see like open the, the on the like you know, open the show yeah. are at a level where you could if they were main eventing, you wouldn't you wouldn't butt an eyelid. It would they're sure. that good. I mean, I kind of watch it. I'm not a wrestler, and I'm so I'm mm. not. I've done a bit of training when I was a teenager, but I yeah. could, you know. I, but I, I sit there and watch it tunnel vision. I don't sort of jump up and down or do a lot of chanting. I'm kind of watching and sort of learning to a degree. Right. But um, so that's how I watch wrestling, and um, yeah, some of these guys just blow me away. Even when they open up the card, there's a kid mm. um, on Rev Pro, Luke Jacobs, at the minute, who is such a hard hitting yeah. guy. Uh, and yeah. when you, yeah, when you know, see, yeah. you know him, yeah, he's got uh, Eddie yeah. Kingston coming up in in October, and I'm. Oh, I'm does he? Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, he's got um, uh, Kenta as well. Uh, show. Yeah, so he's he's putting on banger after banger yeah. in this year. It's going to be so good to watch. Um, but you mentioned also uh, seminars that you do, and one of the questions that one of our team asked, who unfortunately couldn't make the show tonight, was saying that um, what's the sort of difference in teaching a seminar from now to say ten years ago when if you were doing a seminar then? What would be the main differences now that you would say have to look for? <clears throat> um, from personal. Um, standpoint, I, there wouldn't be much difference because obviously I was trained a certain way. Yeah. There's certain things that I think are correct and how things should be done. So that hasn't changed really because I'm always about fundamentals and about the emphasis on you know the psychology of the match and and getting yourself over as a wrestler. And, and regardless of the style, that is always the main point: the, the, telling the story. Entertaining the crowd, getting yourself over as a wrestler is always the three main main purposes of you when you're going into the ring. Um, 
regardless of, of whether it's you know the style as it is now, the style in the early two thousands, or or even old nineteen eighties British style. It was always the same. The purpose is always the same, isn't it? But I tend to just I stick with the basics, make sure they get they, they get those correct fundamentals, and then and then we'll just you know cover. I, I try and be flexible and cover a variety of things that they might want to they might want to study, but. I try and put in some British te- wrestling techniques as well because I always fear that they might get lost. But it's not other than that; nothing really much has changed from my point of view. And that's and to me, and it's an interesting thing about that is the more recent seminars I did, like last year, twenty twenty two, they were very well received because I think it was so different to what they usually do. Yeah. Whereas, say, if you go back ten years, it might have been a little bit samey or a, or a little bit. Oh, Doug's just reinforcing what our trainer told us. That wasn't the case last year. You know, it was more a case of, wow, this is all great new stuff. And that's just simply because the styles moved on and things are getting, you know, I don't want to say they're getting lost, but they, they they just need bringing back into the forefront, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, one of the things I have to learn, because I was I got in the ring at um, mm. our show that we co-produced to announce the championship, and I had to remember where hard cam was. Because okay. obviously, yeah. I know in some things it's yeah. different in some arenas, but I was like, well, where's hard cam? The other thing for me was actually <laughs> getting into the ring, <laughs> which because okay. uh, they didn't have stairs. So I had to sure. knee onto the rope, grab onto the top. So that obviously yeah. not being a wrestler, you don't you don't think about yeah. that. But uh, yeah, hard cam was the one for me, whirling where hard cam was and, and remembering okay. to go over to when you're obvi- you know, I mean obviously when I started TV hadn't been invented so it was just live events so yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really <laughs> you're not to that be fair, no, even, <laughs> even you know um I think the first time I ever became aware of having to position yourself for cameras was Ring of Honor in 2002 when I started working 2002 2003 when I started working for them hmm. and they would say there's the hard cam and you learn, you, you just learn that sort of thing as, as you go along, show to show. But now, you, I did anyway back then. But now it's like almost a a core part of the the training, isn't it? Because yeah. everything is recorded, whether it's streaming, whether it's a TV show, you know, whether it's for DVD, everything is recorded, isn't it? For yeah. for, for content, so yeah, absolutely necessary. More so nowadays because there's also a lot more streaming, like Rev Pro and Progress all have their yeah. streaming channels uh, on as well. So you really have to definitely know where it is because obviously when they go and feed, you're, you're going to go there inside the ropes. So 229 and Great Portland Street is a very intimate, cozy sure, setting. Sure. So you're literally, I mean, I, I literally had a wrestler on my lap at one point uh, during yeah. that show because of where it started, but the cam is in a, such a weird position. Whereas at my show, or not my show, but Ignite show that I was on, it was literally opposite as you come out basically yeah. it was on the other side of it so it was just learning where they are but i'll remember it for this weekend i won't i won't make the same mistake twice that's for sure um let's talk you mentioned ring of honor um ring of mm. honor for me has definitely been an under was always underrated an underrated promotion i always enjoyed watching it. i still do even though it's under you know it's mm. obviously under the aew umbrella now how much did you enjoy the, the ring of honor uh because you're getting that's a different style there's so many different styles and you did have to work a different in little ways when you took on some of those guys in Ring of Honor? <clears throat> mm. Well, it was interesting. I think what what what, what stuck out for me is the fact that um, you, you, you're you in this country, um, you know, back in 2000, 1999, 2001, where, uh, whenever, whenever Ring of Honor started, and you read about Ring of Honor in the newsletters or in the magazines and, you know, this fantastic independent promotion with all these guys and, and putting on these shows and everything. Um, <laughs> but when you get out there, ultimately what it is, is just another independent wrestling show. Mm. All they benefited from was having more exposure, um, you know, than say your average British show, which might be equally as good, you know, and the guys might be equally as talented, but because it's America, the exposure is that much greater. And that's not taking anything away from the guys that work for Ring of Honor. I'm just saying that they're all fantastic talents and they got their exposure. It makes it seem far bigger than what it actually is when you get there. Because when you get there, you think, oh, this is just another independent wrestling show. I'm changing in the basement with no windows, with a dusty floor. <laughs> you know? it's and I have not to quite walk the <laughs> I walk through a door, through some black curtains into the into the hall, 
which is just filled with, which is like a high school gym for for five hundred people. It's so for me that was always, that was that was that probably the, the the most interesting thing about it. Um, obviously, the awareness is there that the exposure, it, 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 you know, or the the spotlight is on you at, to a much greater level than anything I'd ever done in England. Yeah. Um, but I didn't. You just do what you do. You do your job when you get in there, so it was, it was fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you took on the who's who of wrestling nowadays, and you know, mm. doing some reading up on you. Obviously, Joe Danielson, mm. Punk, etc. Even back then, I mean, and someone from you, did you know that these guys, or is it was it obvious that these guys were going to be really special when when you were fighting them back then compared to what they are now? <clears throat> well, it's interesting. You got to think if you go back that far. Um, Great workers did not necessarily equal um, becoming big superstars, becoming mainstream yeah. stars mm. back then. And um, as great as I thought a lot of the guys were, I always thought they are going to be up at a certain level just because of this preconception that guys have to be, you know, 18 stone plus and six foot four. And, and, and that's what, you know, that's what WWE... And WCW would kind of promote at that time, you yeah. know, um, as as stars. They might have they might have a lot of guys, smaller guys on their on their roster, filling out the mid card, lower mid card, and that. But I always thought to myself, it's such a shame that these guys, all, you know, they're all so great, all so fantastically talented. But it's always going to be, including myself, including myself, I have to say it. You always just be stuck, or always get to just such, such a certain level, and. Um, so it was, um, you know, a great relief, or a great relief, but a kind of joyous for me to see that that the attitude within wrestling, within mainstream television wrestling, changed, and these young guys I thought were so talented and so amazing finally got an opportunity to be mainstream stars, you know, and it, and it worked for them because ultimately, at the end of the day, just being big, jacked, tanned isn't isn't the be all end all, is it? You know, no. Definitely not. I mean, I, I grew up when I was watching. Obviously, we watched the British wrestling, and when I got Sky, I yeah. used to find myself liking the Kurt Hennings of this world more more than say the, the Hulk Hogan's three arguments. <laughs> even if you look at Kurt, he's still six foot two. Yeah, he's still quite yeah, playing like seventeen stone. You yes. know what I mean? He still he still had that presence about him that, that they thought mm. was ultimately the most important thing. You know? Yeah. Um, you have to go quite some time before you start finding someone of you know the ilk of um the, right. the, the, you know yeah i mean roddy piper uh, i mean roddy piper you know he's still to me he was always i always wondered when i was a kid why is he so great you know what i mean yeah because he you know physically he was less intimidating than the other ones and i know he had a big mouth now <laughs> look at him now and i think actually he was in shape yeah. He just wasn't as in shape as the rest of the guys. So, you know, that, it's very difficult to put a timeline on when it, it, it kind of changed. It just kind of evolved, I think, over. And um, the, likes of, the likes of Brian Danielson and CM Punk coming in and becoming stars, they were really at the forefront pushing that. Um, and that's what's kind of opened it up for a, a lot more talented guys now. Yeah. It's fantastic, you know. One of those talented guys, and my colleague Dave has just, just messaged. Obviously, his apologies. He couldn't make. He's, he's got some work mm. in tonight. He said that a, a certain Chad Gable uses your chaos theory. Mm. One mm. uh, is that? Do you find it as like a compliment when they take you? Moving? What do you think of Chad Gable as a performer? We rant and rave about him on on this particular podcast. We love Chad. Uh, do you see much of Chad works? And have you seen yeah. him use the chaos theory? Yeah, he he, he he's fantastic, and I think he's very underutilized. Um, the, he, he was obviously given it, you know, in developmental. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I did tweet him and say, um, you know, great chaos series. So I kind of gave him an endorsement and he liked it. So that's it. He liked my tweet, so that's fine. <laughs> I, I'm happy. I'd rather have someone who's does it really, really well and and and, and yeah. gets yeah. great reaction. I mean, the way he did it with. Uh, Braun Strowman was was I, I mean I've never done it on a guy that size. Although taller guys are easier to hit mm. because you can get right underneath them and roll them through. Yeah. But even so you know that was that was fantastic. 
that was a mean feat. So yeah, and, and and I'm so glad he's getting that a, a push push at the moment with 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 um water. Sorry, gun <laughs> gun. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it yeah. So I, I fully endorse him using the chaos theory, and he uses it as a finisher as well. Either people save or or they don't kick out. So yeah, happy days. Yeah, absolutely. And he does use it well. And we're we're big fans of Chad, and we're so glad that he's getting that. Hopefully, he'll get one more match with Gunter. And uh, I want an Iron Man match personally, but that's just the, the t- I just think they need to work uh, in the ring. The, the, the chemistry yeah, yeah. between them two. Um, let's talk TNA. So you, but you actually started TNA. Uh, you had a few sporadic appearances on the tours initially. I think you wrestled in Brentwood. Once in Coventry and in Liverpool. Yeah, their know. first tours in 2008. Yes. Yeah, when I was on all of their, they did, yeah, I can't remember all the times they did, but Brentwood, random, brand, randomly Brentwood. Was <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I did, I did, um, I actually had signed a contract with them before that started. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was my first tour. Um, but I had contractual commitments in Japan until February 2009. So I wasn't able to actually start with TNA. Uh, full time until I, I think it was May two thousand and nine. They brought me in. Yes, for the rich invasion thing. But yeah, yeah. So two thousand. Going back further though, I did yep. two thousand and three. I did the dark match for I was going to say asylum, in Nashville. Yes. Yeah, James Storm, yeah. I believe. <clears throat> yes, with James Storm. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And a funny story on that. I don't know if you've oh. heard it before. We were given eight. So we were given eight minutes for the match. Okay, so we put together this match. Anything? As I'm going through. Gorilla position. To, uh, my entrance music is playing as I'm walking through. The the agent sta- next to me goes, "You got three minutes." I was <laughs> like, "What? You got, you got three minutes?" I walked out. Wow. And then yeah, so poor old James. I mean, obviously, I was I was the the enhancement talent, and James was a star. But I just beat him up for two minutes, and then he pinned me. <laughs> I cut oh. out all his, I cut out everything he- that you had to do because I thought to it. I thought to myself. I'm going to try and get myself over here with whatever little time I've got. You know, when we had eight minutes, it was kind of, I had a little bit of a start. He beat me up. He beat me up. I had maybe one little comeback and then he finished me off. When it got cut, I was thinking, no, I'm just going to take it all myself and he can beat me. Bless him. (laughs) So that's what I did, you know, but, you know. um, Three minutes is nothing really, though, in the grand scheme of things. Like, how how do you cope with, um, changes like that, last minute changes like that. Did you ever find them really difficult, or was it dependent no, on who you were working no. with? I mean, generally rule of thumb is you, you you don't usually have a finishing sequence longer than a couple of minutes for TV matches because you, you you do know that you're getting your, your time cues. So um, it's just a matter of cutting out stuff that's that's ultimately doesn't change the, the story of the match you're telling, you know. Um, I mean, it didn't really matter too much because this was kind of a, a, try, a tryout match or a dark match, whatever you want to call it. But the point it was that that James was going over with his finisher and that's what happened. So yeah. I don't find it too difficult to cut stuff out, really, um, if, I, if, if, if time's going, time, if time is running out, um, I will cut stuff all, out, yeah. Confuses a lot of people, though. I've done it in matches on the fly where you cut stuff out and go, go t- straight to this, go straight to that, and people get lost and confused. Yeah. But I think that, that comes from the modern style of planning 75%, 80% of your match nowadays. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not, obviously, obviously, matches get cut quite often nowadays that you kind of, or you read about it. I mean, you take it with a pinch. Oh, well, we don't we take it with a pinch of salt, but you do hear about it. Yeah. You did early doors wrestle a certain AJ Styles. I think there were a lot in freeway. I think you were doing a lot in freeway matches on the tours, uh, and you were wrestling yeah. a- AJ early doors. Kind of again, he seems to, another one. He's got you're right. He's got the sight, the height kind of thing to him. But again, it took him a while to get to obviously where he's got to now in, in the WWE. But he seemed to be the one that. I always thought it was just the smoothest worker, apart from the Styles Clash, which can get a bit dodgy depending on who you do that on. But uh, he was he was always quite smooth. It was always quite. It looked easy with AJ, maybe more so than others. Allow me to defend the Styles Clash. Please first. do. It's really really easy move to take, and yeah. I don't understand how anyone can screw it up. 
just look at the ground just look yeah. down that's all you have to do yeah um yeah that's that's that so i'm gonna defend the move okay <laughs> and you are right he is he was uh, he's a really really smooth worker easy easy to work with um obviously studies studies different styles and different techniques from around the world he did um so yeah we always work well i mean i think i've only wrestled him in singles matches four or five times ever wow a, a couple of them being on house shows most of the others have been as you say uh three ways um are they the ones on that tour you were talking about with jd lethal yeah uh, but I, we, I did one in fwa which is an old british promotion yeah with me, me aj and jerry lynn which was a lot of fun as well brilliant he was oh, and I, did, I did one in 2014 with me rampage brown and aj styles as well which was really fun interesting that was when aj was iwgp champion so yes it was a, yeah, it wasn't long before he went WWE then, really, 2014, was it? Because he was probably, it wasn't that long yeah. before he went to Rumble, for the debut at the Rumble, was it, after that? That's right, that's right. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. too long. Um, we now talk one of my favourite parts of TNA, which was the British Invasion, yourself, Rob Terry, and a good friend of ours, Nick Aldis, who's also been on. Uh, we had him on a couple of months ago, before he, uh, I believe he's WWE in producing now, or he's doing some kind of shadow yeah. producing there. It was just after he had left. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was it. And just before he uh, went to WWE, um, it was, I mean, from my point of view, it was fantastic to to see three, obviously, the, Rob Terry was the Welsh. I think mean, Rob Terry, he was Welsh, isn't he? Well, yes, he was Welsh, yes. Welsh. Yeah, so it was great to yeah. see uh, these guys in there. And, and you guys really tore it up. And it was so good to see you. Dave, unfortunately, Dave's not on. He was going to do your signature pose that you do, but uh, he, he's not on the show. <laughs> unfortunately, he's been doing it all week. If you watch our shows all week, he's been doing it. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Beer Money was one of your first good guys and another team that I really love. It obviously goes kind of back to where it started for you with James mm. Storm, but obviously Robert Roode was added. How did this British invasion happen? And was it as fun for you guys as it looked for us on the telly? <laughs> well, obviously, I mean, it was a Vince Russo idea. Mm. And um, I think our take on it or, or our kind of attitude is we're going to have as much fun as we possibly can with it yeah. because it's just... Uh, an American's idea of what a British person, you know, a British <laughs> people, people would, uh, yeah. would, would be, you know what I mean? And um, kind of, you know, um, arrogant, a little bit aloof. Um, but uh, yeah, we just decided we'd just go out there and have as much fun with it as possible. Um, and it and it worked, you know, just mm. that's, and, and for me, it was good because. You know, generally up to that point, I was known as a serious technical wrestler. Just go out there and just do something much more fun and interesting. It was you know, just it was it was well, it was great fun for me. I loved it. I loved it. It was great. Yeah, and um, you know, and our few, you know, our few with beer money that we were always told that's the go-to match. If they were always if they were struggling for a tag match, um, then they'd always. Book beer money and, and, and British invasion. I think I think I've, I think we did about twenty or thirty house show loots with them in the wow. end <laughs> over a two year period. So I um, want to quickly discuss Full Metal Mayhem, which is TNA's tables, ladders, and chairs. Uh, I, this is a question. I think I've asked this a couple of times with some of the guys, ex WWE guys. Who are on, how do you? Because obviously, look, wrestling hurts no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you're taking a body slam or a headlock takeover or whatever. It's a it's a painful job. But this one, because you're falling off of ladders, you're getting hit with chairs, you're going through tables. Do you have to prepare yourself mentally as well as physically for that kind of match? <clears throat> No, not really, because you do quite a lot of that stuff on the independent scene when you should really shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it in a lot less safer environment, you know, with, with That's a, a fair point. It's a lot less reliable. So I'm much happier going through a, a properly um, prepared table than I might do going through some, you know, some pasting table that someone's bought at the local uh, um, hardware store and... and <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've had a few independent ladder matches where the match ladders have collapsed on me because they're so bad. So um, I don't think you have to prepare yourself mentally. You you understand the risks involved, um, and you and, and 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 to me, there's people that are prepared to take certain bumps, and there's people that are not. Mm -hmm. But then there's people that are prepared to 
you know, um, put themselves in a position where they look like they're almost going to do it and then someone else will take the bump for them. And it's just you work around everybody. So everybody's got something to do um, and it all comes across, you know, professional and safe and hopefully nobody gets hurt too much. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously there's pain and then there's injury and they're two different things. And um, pain is something that occurs in every single wrestling match, you know. Um, going through a table is, I don't know, just... I'm going to expose the business here. Going through a table is a lot, it's probably a lot less painful than 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 um, people might expect because it breaks your fall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it does. It does do that. Um, but one of the other matches that you were in, because you after that a little while, like you were the X Division champion, and you come to London, and you had an Ultimate X match, which mm. uh, <laughs> another one mm. of those uh, kind of matches where it's again, is these matches hard to? Um, kind of what was the word I'm going to try and use for this? Uh, plan out the uh, Olmex or them sort of gimmicky matches where you've got a lot of moving. No, up. because because obviously you're, you're trying to sell the gimmick, okay? Yes. And in the in the say in, in in the case of that one you're talking about, which I think was a five way or maybe a six way, so yes. six of us involved, you make sure each guy shines in, in some respect, each guy has a spot where they shine, and that's yes. that, that that's basically how you put the match together everybody has a shine to make themselves look good and then you do something where everybody's wiped out and the winner eventually you know gets the win so i always find those matches far easier to plan gimmick matches are far easier to plan than say a regular singles or even a regular three the worst types of matches to plan are like multi-man four and five way matches where you just got about think about everything everybody and what they're trying to do and where they are um, gimmick matches are, are, are easy because you're trying to get the gimmick over. Sure, that's you it. Know, that essentially is what it is, isn't it? So yeah. Um, how did it change when when the likes of Hogan and Bischoff coming? So they got done fortune, mm -hmm. and you were feuding with them a little bit. Was there a big noticeable change? Because at that point, was that the point where TNA were going up against the WWE on a Monday night? Yeah, that, that was a gradual change because it was. Um, they came in the beginning of 2010. But then I, I had my whole X Division run during 2010. Yeah. Um, and then really, once Vince and Jerry left, Vince Russo and mm -hmm. Jerry, Jeff, <laughs> um, when Vince Russo and, and Jeff Jarrett left um, and uh, more creative control was given to um, kind of Bruce Richard and, 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 and Hogan is where I was kind of, um, kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit, and that's mm. well, that's so. End of two thousand and ten, beginning of two thousand and eleven, it's kind of changed for me. Um, but it's it, it's more a case of who was who was who was um, who was in my corner, and 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 and, and those people left, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, so. Uh, for, yeah. And Fee, we're going to have to talk about it now because we've just got off. We've just finished talking about the latest episode, but let's let's talk NWA. Uh, and Fee, you love NWA, so you can have some time now. Let me rest my hands. Oh, well, obviously, now I'm trying to rack my brain. So it was like, obviously, last year, um, met you out in Nashville at the Crockett Cup. Super, super excited. I have I'd never had the pleasure of seeing British Invasion, you and Nick tag together. So I was absolutely buzzing for that. Like, even just to beat the Crockett Cup was like a massive, massive deal for me. Obviously, things changed with that, and the British invasion became the the Commonwealth Correction. Yeah. Um, was that was your first kind of foray with NW at the time, wasn't it? Had you been in that was what? Had you been no, in my first Crockett Cup, wasn't it? it? It was my first Crockett Cup. But I've been with I've been with the NWA. Um, when was that? June was it, or was that May? That was March. March. No. Yeah, that was my March first, last year. So that was my March first set of taping. My sorry, my first set of taping for NWA were in December. Yeah, that's when you initially teamed with Nick. Twenty twenty one. Yeah, and that's when that's right. Nick set up the re reunited, reunited um, British Invasion. So yeah, the March tapings were obviously yeah. the second time I've been out there, um, where it all got changed about. So uh, yeah, uh, how, it was how, interesting. Sorry. Yeah, how did you find the Crockett Cup? I love tag team wrestling. Like that's probably oh, my oh, favorite. Um, oh, yeah. It was fantastic. I mean, um, obviously, because we knew that we had to get, because we were a brand new team, we had to put a, sh a strong showing in on both nights. Yeah. And I think we did that. 
Um, obviously, I was really, really familiar with um, the Briscoes, wrestled them many, many times. So, you know, the final two to me was easy, great match. Um, and yeah, I, I really fun. And do you know what? In hindsight, it was probably better for the change as well. Yeah. Um, because it was, it gave us kind of a fresh, you know, it was a fresh team. People kind of had us as not really sure we were underdogs, who we were, how we were going to do. So it was, it was, you know, let, left people impressed. So I was, I was pleased yeah. with that. No, I mean, I, I, I had a great, that was like awesome for me to be there and that. And then obviously mm -hmm. after that, hey, you eventually went on to to win the, the NWA Tag Team mm -hmm. Championships. Again, yeah. how how was that experience for you? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously for me, growing up, being a big um, fan of NWA Tag Wrestling, I mean, I love the Steiners. I thought they're one of my favourite teams of all time. Um it was, it was, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a belt mark. I understand that there is, there, you know, I know because I'm a wrestler that they're a tool for telling stories, but by the same token, they are the, the promotion recognizing you as the figurehead of the division, you know, the tag division, and 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 being the most important representatives of that. And um, so it was an honour for me that they elected to 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 put the belts on us. You know, they obviously had faith in us. They impressed with what they saw, and they had hopes for us going forward. Um, so yeah, what it was a nice feeling, really. Um, and of course, it's NWA, isn't it? It's the the legacy of that particular promotion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I want to go a bit further back because you did make an appearance in WWE. Um, mm. It's Carlito of all people. Mm. Uh, he made a dark match in England in November two thousand and six. Mm. Um, Carlito is now well, apparently been re-signed we although he's not got they've not got anything for him as it stands at the minute but uh what was that experience like at WWE? So obviously obviously you say you was going to be enhancement talent colleague i was going to go over in that but what was did because wwe is the creme de la creme isn't it so it still is yeah. at the moment the creme yeah. de la creme of, of, yeah. of wrestling no matter what anyone says um did you notice big differences in there when say for example because obviously at that time you'd literally done a few bits of roh and, and come off the, the independence mm -hmm. was that a big culture change though for you um, not particularly in terms of what I was doing in the ring, how I was instructed. There wasn't that I've done big arena shows uh, in Japan already at that point. Um, it, 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 it wasn't the only, the one thing that always stuck out to me because it's the biggest crowd I worked in front of up to that point was the sheer noise and the the the, the build the building almost rumbling you know with with the sound of the audience that was that was probably the biggest biggest thing for me but no it was it, it was funny really because it was really cool in the locker room most people knew who i was which was nice you know <laughs> so they let me change in the main locker room and that was all cool um so yeah no it was a really really positive experience um and i thought i'd get a job out of it but but I wasn't big enough, so there you go. That's well, literally yeah. what they told me. Oh, is that is that what the words were? That, that was it, was it? Yeah, wow. Wow. yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. That's, uh... No, Tommy Dreamer was in um, talent relations at the time, so he's not one to pull his punches, you know. And, he, well, and, and it wasn't, and it's uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't his decision, obviously. But he no. said, that, yeah. "Wow, yeah. unbelievable!" Because you think nowadays it's quite a you know size yeah, right. the kind of size doesn't really matter nowadays is it because you as we mentioned earlier one you are getting the likes of that there's one other match that i want to quick mention this was in i believe fwa eddie guerrero okay yeah no nah. it wasn't fwa was it not com common misconception <laughs> <laughs> well i thought the it was, was actually promoted by uh, a guy called tommy boyd who was a okay. radio presenter um and he called the, the it was a one-off show the promotion was called swat i can't remember what it stood for Something wrestling, something, something, probably. <laughs> okay. He used FWA in its, you know, in terms of the ring and the the, the uh, sound systems and and the crews and that sort of stuff. But the TV production was actually done by Bravo themselves. You know, the channel okay. Bravo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they were the actual team. They actually did the producing. That was their cameramen. It was their their whole TV setup. Um, 
yeah so um yeah kind of fwa only in, in wrestlers only i'd say in wrestlers only but uh eddie guerrero <laughs> what a match to have though eddie guerrero <clears throat> Yeah, it's interesting. It's a learning experience for me. Um, and I, what I took away from that is what I had to be in order to be a world-class wrestler, what I had to do, what I had to know. Um, and yeah, so I managed to, hopefully, I managed to apply those things successfully. You know, I think degree. so. I think so. I've yeah. seen you many times on the UK circuit. I mean, I, I, it makes me laugh. People go, oh, it's a great match. They watch it. And to me, yeah, it's okay, but he, he just eats me up. <laughs> <laughs> he just he just he's all over me like a rash yeah um and i see it but maybe other people don't you know so uh, anyway that's, that's brilliant and uh, we won't keep you much longer now let's let's start wrapping up for you because it's oh, i appreciate you coming sure, on okay. taking the time okay what are you doing you've got that show is there anything else you've got going on other than that show and where can they get tickets to go and watch that show if they're in manchester or the risk surrounding areas yeah um <laughs> skittle.com is the is the is where you go know, to get your tickets um and i say yeah it's um an evening with Doug Williams. I can't remember the name of the venue. My God, Mark Adams is going to kill me. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, is it Stretford Mall? Isn't it one two seven one two eight? Is it called Head or okay. Head, Head one two seven one two eight? Stretford Mall, Chester Road, Manchester. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's on your poster. No, I've got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tickets are only ten pounds. Um, you can come. I, you know, I, I'm not overly familiar with the format of Mark how he runs these, but I can imagine there's going to be some sort of Q&A in there somewhere. We'll get some fun stories. People can get my take on a lot of things that, um, I think there's a lot of things that people seem to have forgotten about that, that you know, maybe I could bring to the fore and they'd be interested in, like the whole experience of um, how I was involved in bringing Kenta Kabashi and Mizawa to, the, to, to Europe in the first yeah. instance, you know, in the first place, those sort of things. Um, development of British wrestling over the years. Um my own personal experiences of various different current stars. There's so much that I, I mean, you know, we're talking 30 years of 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 of, of, um, of stories, really. So, I, you know, I, you know, yeah, come along, please, come along and, and be entertained, have a few drinks, and uh, we'll have a laugh. But yeah, that's uh, November the 12th, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, I think it says 7:30 start. Hold on. Progress are running that day in Manchester. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, um, you know, the, it, 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 out it, then. yeah, the doors, so open at seven, so yeah, seven thirty start would probably be about right. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Uh, anything else, Doug? You got uh, going on? Um, the only other thing I know of at the moment is I've got a seminar in Hanover in Germany. Wow, in October, nice. um, that's October the 14th, I think. Um, a Saturday, let me uh, let me let me double check that. I'm so bad at this, aren't I? Yeah, 14th, 14th October. So it's a yeah, it's a um it, there's a Hanover, there's a three-day Hanover um tournament on. Um, and then so in the afternoon on the Saturday, I'm doing a, a seminar there for all you uh European wrestlers who might want to learn something. I'm just Come along to that. Because, uh, I think I think my uh, one of us one of the wrestlers that we sponsor is going to be over in Germany, but I'd, oh yeah, because it could it be that weekend, 14th and the 15th of October. That's it, yeah. So yeah, we've got our it. wrestler, the wrestler that we sponsor, uh, Corey McRae, is okay. uh, going to be wrestling on that show, on those shows. So oh, maybe. Wow. Amazing. So there great. you go. So if, you, if you do want to look at his backside, you will see uh, the hit in the turnbuckle. <laughs> Before you saw it when you went, he was wearing. The, <laughs> he's got his little. He's got his little sponsorship on his trunks. So he's definitely a UK strong style. We would say that that's how okay. he. That's how he is. Uh, but he is Corey McRae. If you ever get to see him, that he, he, that will be him. Uh, so he'll be there. Uh, Fee. Okay. You're going to be quite busy. I well, know you've already said this tonight, but say it again yeah, for everybody. So, Tell us um, PBW, Premier British Wrestling, this Friday night, we have a show in Larbert. Um, again, there is some general admission tickets still available from ringside.co.uk. Um, haven't seen the card. I've got no idea what's happening with the show yet. I will probably find out on Friday when I get there. So that'll be fun. Um, I am working with Worldwide Wrestling League, aka W3L, on Saturday, which I believe is uh, where Doug had his last match, his final match. Was it W3L? Indeed. That's correct. Yes. So I'm working. 
Yeah, so, which I missed, unfortunately. I was booked elsewhere that day or I would have been emceeing that show, so I am devastated I missed that. But um, I'm with W3L on Saturday down in Newark in Ayrshire. Next Saturday, um, I am working with Pro Wrestling Scotland, uh, which is run by TJ Rage up here. Um, we are in Moody's Burn on Saturday. Um, I didn't know where the location was earlier, so I checked that. We're in Moody's Burn on Saturday. That's in conjunction with Big Massive Wrestling, so a kind of joint promotion show. And then on Sunday, the 24th, I jump on a plane over to Ireland for five nights on the road with Inside the Ropes and Mr. Eric Bischoff. So I am very excited. We'll be in, the Sunday will be in Cork, Monday in Dublin, Tuesday in Belfast, Wednesday in London, and Thursday up in Glasgow. So just a little side to that, I will also be there in London. Yeah. I'm going to be right. Um, we could have done this live, face yeah. to face, in a week's time <laughs> instead. I am his official entourage for his London portion of that that tour. Wow. So uh, yeah, I will be there as well. If uh, anybody wants to come up and say hello to me um, instead of Eric Bischoff, please do so. <laughs> I will be doing that. Now I know you're going to be there. I'm going to the London show as well. Uh, uh, okay. Some of the team are going to come there. Uh, I will just finish off with my events before we bid you uh, a goodbye. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. we had this tonight, Sunday. I'm at Ignite Wrestling Pro as we uh, crown the first ever turnbuckle champion. There's a stacked card there. Corey McRae's on that card. He's defending against Jude Money. Do they get a golden turnbuckle to, as a, as a top no, 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 it's more of like an RO. It's an ROH style belt. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll show. I'll, I'll send it to you. You can see. Uh, so they're going to have a. Uh, the winner of that is out of Lance Rivera, George Lyon, and the Smashing Mike. So they'll be in a, in a triple threat match for that. Next, okay. next Thursday, uh, we talk to the first ever winner of Tough Enough and the three time Hardcore Champion Maven Huffman. And then after that, I will be in London with you guys to meet Mr. Eric Bischoff for the first time. But Doug, this has been a fantastic for me. But first, for a fan of British wrestling and a fan of you, and I've, I've watched a lot of your matches over here in the UK, it's been brilliant to sit here and have a conversation you. with you. Thank you so much for taking some of your time just to come on this evening. Uh, Fiona, I would say thank you to you, but we're going to be doing this again next week when we review yeah, the third yeah. episode of NWA Power. Uh, the reason why I thanked you both for your time is I do give away a little bit of something what's going on in 2024 as we finish. So I thank you both for your time. And as I end, I will say these words like I did at the end of uh, the NWA show, uh, which is buckle up 2024. And on that note, guys, this has been the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast with Doug Williams, Fiona Lockroom, and myself, Adam Cousins. Until next time, everybody, buckle down and stay safe.